This is a list of secondary characters from the science fiction television series Star Trek – Deep Space Nine. Characters are ordered alphabetically by family name, and only characters who played a significant major role in the series are listed. Star Trek – Deep Space Nine was a science fiction television show of the Star Trek franchise that aired between 1993 and 1999, and many of the characters integrate into the wider Star Trek science fiction universe. Topic. Recurring characters Topic. Burrell Antos Burrell Antos was a Bajoran Videk. He was played by Philip Anglum. Burrell becomes romantically involved with Major Kira Neris of the Deep Space Nine space station. He runs against Videk winner Darmai for the role of Kai, but is forced to drop out to protect the reputation of the previous Kai, Opaka. Burrell is injured in a shuttle explosion, and Dr. Julian Bashir has to replace his failing organs with cybernetics so that he can continue to advise Win in negotiations with the Kardashians. His continued efforts in this weakened state cause brain damage, and eventually his death. In the Mirror Universe, Burrell Antos is a petty thief who is close to the alternate Kira. He leaves his universe in a foiled attempt to steal an orb. Topic. Brunt Brunt is a liquidator with the Ferengi Commerce Authority FCA, portrayed by Jeffrey Combs. He is the nemesis of Quark, whom he perceives as a threat to the Ferengi way of life, and often attempts to either destroy him or supplant Grand Nagus Zek although at one time, he did help Quark rescue Ishka from the Dominion. By sharp contrast, his mirror universe counterpart was a friendly and congenial person, with unrequited feelings for his universe's Esri Tegan, who ended up being murdered by the intendant Mira Kira Neris. Brunt or his counterpart appeared in eight episodes beginning with season three's Family Business. Combs has described Brunt as the IRS guy from hell. Topic: <laughs> Kretak, Kamara. Kamara Kretak is a senator and representative of the Romulan Empire for a short time aboard Deep Space Nine. She is accused of treason against the Star Empire and found guilty in the episode, Inter Arma Enum Silent Leges. The ending of the episode leaves her fate ambiguous, with it unclear if she will be imprisoned or executed. Kamara Kretak was first portrayed by Megan Cole in Image in the Sand and Shadows and Symbols and Adrian Barbo in Inter Arma Enum Silent Leges. Topic. Korat Dammer Dammer is a Cardassian military officer portrayed by Casey Biggs. As a Glyn, he served under Gul Dukat aboard the freighter Grumel, and later as Gul Dukat's aide when the Cardassian Union joined the Dominion and then captured Deep Space Nine. Dammer discovered a way to disable the Federation's self-replicating mines, which had been preventing the Dominion from sending reinforcements from the Gamma Quadrant through the Bajoran wormhole, and was recommended for promotion to the rank of Gul. As the Federation retook the station, Dama learned that Tora Zial had been helping Kira and others undermine them and promptly killed her. This earned him personal enmity from Kira. After Dukat's subsequent mental breakdown following his daughter's death, Dama was promoted to first ghoul and then legate. As leader, he learned that the Dominion was merely using the Kardashians as pawns in its effort to conquer the Alpha Quadrant, so he switched sides and encouraged his people to fight the Dominion. As leader of the new Cardassian rebellion, he had to accept Federation aid and advice from a Starfleet advisor, Colonel Kira Neris, who was given a Starfleet field commission of commander to take on the role. In his struggles as a resistance fighter, particularly when his wife and child were taken and killed by the Dominion, he came to understand the Bajoran perspective during Kardash's occupation of Baja. While fighting beside Commander Kira Neris and Elam Garrick in a final push to retake Cardassia Prime, Dama was killed in action. Dama appeared in 23 episodes beginning with Season 4's Return to Grace. Topic. Dax Dax is a trill symbiont, that has been joined to nine humanoid trills Leela Dax Tobin Dax Emini Dax Audra Dax Torias Dax Joran Dax portrayed by Jeff McBride and Lee McCloskey Curzon Dax portrayed by Frank Owen Smith Jadzia Dax portrayed by Terry Farrell 
Esri Dax portrayed by Nicole de Boer Other Dax hosts were Virad Dax portrayed by John Glover Yedrin Dax portrayed by Gary Frank Topic. Ducat Topic. Eddington, Michael Michael Eddington was a Starfleet security officer holding the rank of lieutenant commander. He was stationed on Deep Space Nine by Starfleet due to their lack of complete trust in Odo. Following orders from a Starfleet admiral, he sabotaged the Defiance cloaking system when Captain Sisko defied orders by taking the ship on a mission to the Gamma Quadrant. On another occasion he was instrumental in helping recover the command staff when, while beaming back to the station, their neural patterns were stored in the station computer and their physical forms were placed in a holosuite program. He later defected to the Marquis after working for them to steal several industrial-grade replicators destined for the Cardassian Union. He likened himself and Cisco to characters from Les Miserables, Jean Valjean, and Javert, respectively, but was eventually captured and imprisoned. He was later killed while fighting alongside Cisco in a successful attempt to rescue survivors of a Marquis colony from the Dominion. Michael Eddington was portrayed by Kenneth Marshall, appearing as a semi-regular in the series beginning with Season 3's The Search, Part 1. In 2016, the character was ranked as the 77nd most important character in service to Starfleet within the Star Trek science fiction universe by Wired magazine. Topic: Fontaine, Vic. Topic: Garrick, Elam. Topic: Gauron. The character Gauron debuted in 1990 in the episode Reunion. Directed by Jonathan Frakes, and was featured in several episodes of Deep Space Nine over the show's run. Topic Ishka. Topic Lita. Lita is a recurring character on Deep Space Nine, portrayed by Chase Masterson. She is a Bajoran employed as a Dabo girl in Quark's bar. After a brief romantic relationship with Julian Bashir, she married Rom and therefore ended the series as First Lady of Ferengina. Although initially played as a stereotypical airhead, over the course of the series it is revealed that she is an intelligent woman who chooses to maintain a carefree attitude. She is a ringleader when Quark's employees attempt to start a trade union, and also volunteers to play temporary host to one of Jadzia Dax's former personalities. She explained in Letty Who Is Without Sin that Dabo girls actually have to be good at math to ensure that the house always makes a profit. Unlike most Bajoran characters, Lita is never given a family name. The non canon novels explain that this is because she was brought up in an orphanage during the Cardassian occupation and does not have a family name. Martok Topic. Mila Mila, played by Juliana McCarthy, was for over three decades the housekeeper of Anabran Tain, the head of the Obsidian Order. Possibly, during their time together, Tain and Mila had a child, whom they named Elam Garrick. Due to Tain's position, it was decided to hide the fact that he was Garrick's father. No confession from Tain, Mila, or Garrick were made supporting this, but Garrick does treat Mila as a mother as it is most likely that she was the only such figure in his life. In 2371, Tane considered having Mila killed because she knew too much about him. However, he did not go through with her execution. She was killed by Dominion soldiers on the eve of Kardashian's liberation from the Dominion. She appeared in three episodes as well as in the novel A Stitch in Time by Andrew J. Robinson. <laughs> Topic. Dr. Maura Pohl Dr. Maura Pohl was the Bajoran scientist who was assigned to study the changeling who would become known as Odo. Dr. Maura studied and taught Odo at the Bajoran Center for Science during the occupation of Baja from 2358-2365. When Odo assumed the shape of a humanoid, he imitated Dr. Maura's hairstyle. 
Odo initially resented Dr. Mora for failing to realize he was sentient. Under pressure from the Kardashians to get answers and not fully understanding what he was dealing with, Dr. Mora used some questionable methods in his experiments. Odo left the institute two years later. They would not reconcile their differences until 2373, when Dr. Mora arrived on Deep Space Nine to assist Odo in treating an infant changeling. Dr. Mora Pohl was played by actor James Sloyan. Morn Morn, played by Mark Allen Shepard, is a Lurian male, the only member of his species seen in Star Trek. Morn is a frequent customer in Quark's bar, often present in the background of scenes there. According to makeup designer Michael Westmore, on the first day of filming the series the director chose Morn randomly from among several prosthetic characters. Westmore went to great lengths to ensure that Morn could talk if the character ever had a line, but Morn remained silent throughout the series. This became a running gag, with other characters commenting several times how talkative he was. Morn is credited with knowing the funniest joke in the universe, and in several episodes an incidental character is seen to start laughing as they leave his side. Quark sometimes breaks down laughing when he tries to retell the joke, and always gives up by saying that no one can tell it like Morn. Despite this, Morn rarely seems to get Quark's jokes, and when he does, it takes him a while. Morn's existence as a fixture at Quark's bar is mocked in the episode, Who Mourns for Morn? When Quark sets up a hollow imager to project an image of Morn on his regular stool, quietly drinking. No one realizes that it is not real until Sisko and Dax run into the bar to let people know that Morn died. It is later revealed that he did not die but had faked his death. Mark Allen Shepard plays a dual role in this episode. Apart from his regular appearance as Morn, he plays a Bajoran officer invited to sit in Morn's usual chair at the bar. Often, other characters refer to something Morn has done that, to the viewer, would seem uncharacteristic for Morn. For example, when it became clear that war with the Dominion was inevitable, Morn threw a chair at Quark, then ran naked across the promenade screaming, We're all doomed. Following that, he supposedly rushed into a Bajoran temple and threw himself at the feet of Major Kira, begging for forgiveness. Vic Fontaine, the holographic singer who is a recurring character in seasons 6 and 7, has stated that Morn's rendition of New York, New York has to be seen to be believed. Lieutenant Commander Worf claimed that Morn was a formidable sparring partner, and the pair fought in the Holosuites on a weekly basis. Jadzia Dax also said she had nearly become romantic with Morn, except that Morn turned her down. Very little is revealed about Morn or his species on the show. Quark establishes in Through the Looking Glass that Morn has more than one heart. In The Way of the Warrior, it was implied Lurians are usually found near the Iodite Nebula. A hostile Klingon suggested it was suspicious to find Morn so far from there. It was revealed in the episode Who Mourns for Morn that he had been previously involved in some criminal activities, the most notable being a robbery in which his crew stole 1,000 bricks of gold pressed latinum. Like all Lurians, Morn has two stomachs. Quark realized that he had extracted the liquid latinum from the bricks and was storing it in one stomach, causing his hair to fall out. Morn regurgitated 100 bricks worth and gave it to Quark as a reward for helping to get the other thieves arrested. Morn also appeared in the Star Trek, the Next Generation episode, Birthright, Part 1, and made a cameo in the Star Trek, Voyager episode, Caretaker. Because of these appearances, this has made Morn one of the few characters to appear in three of the Star Trek series, alongside Quark, who appeared in TNG, DS9, and Voyager, Commander Riker, TNG, DS9, Riker's transporter clone, Voyager, and Enterprise, Deanna Troy, TNG, Voyager, and Enterprise, Kang, the original series, DS9 and Voyager, and Q, TNG, DS9, and Voyager. Topic. Nog. Topic: O'Brien, Keiko. Keiko O'Brien, born Keiko Ishikawa, is played by Rosalind Chow. She is a professional botanist and the wife of Miles O'Brien in both The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Keiko married Miles O'Brien aboard the USS Enterprise D in the TNG episode Data's Day. A year later, temporarily stuck in Ten Forward, she gave birth to a daughter, Molly, with Worf as midwife. TNG episode Disaster. Shortly after arriving at Deep Space Nine, Keiko decided to start a school. Jake Sisko and Nog were the first students to enroll. Later, Keiko went on a botanical expedition to Baja when pregnant with her second child. An accident endangered mother and child on the way back to DS9. 
Dr. Julian Bashir saved them both by removing the fetus and implanting it into Kira Neris' womb. In her honor, the child was named Kiriyoshi. When the Dominion War began, Keiko and the children were evacuated from the war zones. They remained away for a time until the fields of battle had shifted far enough to make Deep Space Nine safe again. After the war, the O'Brien family relocated to Earth when Miles became an instructor at Starfleet Academy. <laughs> O'Brien, Molly Molly O'Brien, played by Hannah Hattai, is the daughter of Keiko and Miles O'Brien and the older sister of Kiriyoshi. She originally appeared on Star Trek, The Next Generation. Molly was born in 2368, with Worf delivering her, on the USS Enterprise-D in the TNG episode, Disaster. She moved to Deep Space Nine when Miles was assigned there. In the DS9 episode, Time's Orphan, the O'Briens went on a picnic to Galana IV, where Molly accidentally fell into an abandoned time portal and emerged as an 18-year-old, played by Michelle Krushek. From her point of view, she had experienced approximately 10 years of solitary existence. Back at Deep Space Nine, she was wild and uncontrollable, unable to cope with life on the space station. After a violent altercation in Quarks, Starfleet officials intended to place her in a mental health institution. The O'Briens returned to Galana IV, hoping to send Molly back through the time portal to the place and time she had become accustomed to, preferring her happiness over a possible lifetime of confinement. However, she was returned to the point where she had first entered, allowing the adult Molly to help her child counterpart return home, erasing the adult Molly from history in the process. <laughs> Opaka Sulan Opaka Sulan, played by Camille Saviola, was the Kai or spiritual leader of the Bajorans through the latter years of the Cardassian occupation and the first few months after it ended in 2369. Opaka recognized Benjamin Sisko as the long-awaited emissary of the Prophets, although he did not return her enthusiasm. In response to a prophetic orb experience, Opaka left Baja for the first time to pay an unannounced visit to DS9. Journeying with Sisko and Kira through the wormhole, she was killed in a runabout crash on the Ennis Penal Moon, and was then resurrected by the artificial microbes present there. The microbes were specifically designed to only work on the moon, forcing her to stay behind. She took this as an opportunity to help end the prisoners' fanatical clan war. During the Cardassian occupation, Opaka had been a collaborator, she gave away the whereabouts of a rebel base and her son was killed in the subsequent attack. The Kardashians had threatened to destroy some Bajoran towns so by betraying the rebels including her own son she saved thousands of Bajoran lives. Later on, Borel Antos dropped out of the election for Kai in an effort to keep this secret from ruining Opaka's legacy. This led to the election of the more controversial winner Darmai. <laughs> Rom Quark's brother, father of Nog Topic. Ross, William J. Vice Admiral William J. Ross, played by Barry Jenner, was the field commander of Starfleet forces during the Dominion War and was the coordinator of Starfleet's defense of the Bolian and Bajoran fronts in the early stages of that war. His command post was on Starbase 375, where he was in direct command of the 7th Tactical Wing. During the first three months of the war, Ross was under severe pressure to halt the advance of the Dominion. Ross did this by making Captain Sisko his adjutant, to relieve himself of making minor tactical plans and reports. This action gave Ross the initiative to find the Argolis Cluster Sensor Array. This sensor array was the Dominion's line of sight over all the Bajoran and Bolian fronts at the start of the war. Ross, along with Sisko, planned the attack on the Argolis Array and succeeded in the destruction of the array in late March 2374. As the war progressed, Ross took a much more tactical role rather than strategically planning the war effort. After the First Battle of Chintoka, Ross was posted aboard Deep Space Nine to command the Allied forces presently hemmed in at Chintoka. It was later revealed that Ross was one of the few Starfleet personnel to know of the existence of Section 31. Although he collaborates with Section 31 in one of their operations, like Julian Bashir he staunchly maintains that he is not a member of the organization. During the Battle of Cardassia, Ross led the Starfleet wing of the assault fleet. He devised the planned assault on Cardassia and, soon afterwards, presided over the signing of the Treaty of Baja at which he gave a speech to the delegates. Ross appears in 12 episodes beginning with the season 6 episode, 
A Time to Stand. In 2016, the character of Admiral Ross was ranked as the 41st most important character of Starfleet within the Star Trek science fiction universe by Wired magazine. Topic: <laughs> Shakar Eden. Shakar Eden was a resistance leader, farmer, and later first minister of Baja. He was played by Duncan Regeer. A one-time farmer in Baja's Dakur province, Shakar returned to his fields in 2369 after 25 years of fighting the Cardassian occupiers, only to enter politics as his world's secular leader in 2371. As the head and namesake of Kira's resistance cell, he agreed to let her go on her first raid at age 13 to fill in a vacancy in the ranks, and reteamed with her years later during a near-violent showdown with Kai Win over the return of promised soil reclamators. After that encounter, and the support he received for his handling of it, Shakar handily won the position as Baja's second post-occupation first minister, defeating acting minister Wynne in an election. As he works with Kira in her role of senior Bajoran on DS9, Shakar realizes he has fallen in love with her and they begin a relationship. He successfully pushed to fast-track Baja's admission to the UFP, but that act was postponed at the last minute by emissary Benjamin Siskar's Pagtumfa sacred vision that it was not the right time. As Shakar and Kira's affair played out, he had a hard time accepting her carrying the O'Brien's transplanted second child to term after an accident in 2373. Soon afterward, he and Kira part ways romantically, after a visit to the Kendra Shrine on Baja revealed that they were not meant to walk the same path. Kira still respects him as Baja's best leader. Shakar is used to death threats and he routinely ignores them, but a true way alien operative nearly kills him twice during the Federation conference on DS9, first by sending his turbolift car into free fall, and later by almost getting his quarters depressurized. According to Dukat, Shakar slept with every woman in his resistance cell except Kira. But Dukat's jealousy of the Major should be taken into account. Topic. Cisco, Joseph. Joseph Sisko, father of Captain Benjamin Sisko, was played by Brock Peters, who also played Admiral Cartwright in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Joseph ran a restaurant in New Orleans called, Sisko's Creole Kitchen, DS9S7EP1, Image in the Sand, with a particular specialty each night, generally seafood. While Nog was at Starfleet Academy, he commuted from San Francisco to dine, as Joseph obtained Ferengi tube grubs especially for Nog. Joseph's grandson, Jake Sisko, often worked at the restaurant, and Benjamin worked there after the Par Wraiths collapsed the wormhole events of S6 EP26, Tears of the Prophets, S7 EP1, Image in the Sand, S7 EP2, Shadows and Symbols. Joseph was first married to a woman named Sarah, but when their son Benjamin was a year and a half old, Sarah left, eventually moving to Australia and dying in a shuttle accident. Joseph remarried soon after, and Benjamin and his stepmother had such a close relationship Joseph could not bring himself to disclose the truth to his son, that Sarah was, in fact, a prophet that took physical form. This discovery was made by Benjamin and Jake in the episodes, Image in the Sand, and Shadows and Symbols. Though Joseph Sisko does eventually reveal to Benjamin the truth about Sarah, he vows to take his gumbo recipe to the grave. Topic. Sloan, Luther Luther Sloan was played by William Sadler. An operative in the intelligence agency known as Section 31, Sloan appeared in three episodes of Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Inquisition, Inter Arma Enum Silent Leges, and Extreme Measures. In 2374, Sloan placed Dr. Julian Bashir in a psychologically intense holodeck scenario designed to test his loyalties to the Federation. Satisfied that Bashir was a steadfast Starfleet officer, Sloan offered Bashir a position in Section 31, knowing of the Doctor's fondness for 20th-century espionage fiction. Bashir adamantly refused, but Sloan was content to let him consider the offer. In 2375, Sloan assigned Bashir for a mission to gather information on Koval, chairman of the Romulan Tal Shir, claiming that the Doctor was already a member of Section 31. Bashir initially refused, but agreed with Captain Sisko that this would allow them to learn more about Section 31's operations and possible connections to Starfleet Command. 
However, unbeknownst to both of them, Sloan had already enlisted the assistance of Admiral William Ross and thus succeeded in strengthening covert ties to one highly placed Romulan and subverting the career of another. Sloan appeared to perish at Koval's hand, but later appeared in Bashir's quarters to thank him for playing his part and living up to Sloan's high expectations of him. Later that year, Bashir discovered evidence that Section 31 was responsible for infecting Odo with a genocidal virus intended to bring an end to the Dominion War. With the assistance of Miles O'Brien, Bashir lured Sloan to Deep Space Nine and captured him. Rather than risk handing Bashir the cure, Sloan triggered a neuro-depolarizing device in his brain, effectively killing himself. After stabilizing Sloan, Bashir and O'Brien linked their minds to his in a last-ditch effort to secure information that would lead to a cure. While inside Sloan's mind, Bashir was offered secret information that could supposedly bring about the end of Section 31. This was Sloan's way of delaying Bashir from escaping with the knowledge needed to save Odo's life, and the lives of the founders. <laughs> Solbor Solbor was played by James Otis. Solbor was a Bajoran and an assistant to Kai Wynn. He was killed by Kai Wynn when he threatened to expose Dukat and the Kai's betrayal of the prophets. He appeared in three episodes. Tain, Anabran Anabran Tain, played by Paul Dooley, was the former head of the Obsidian Order and the biological father of Elam Garrick. However, he never admitted this fact publicly, believing that his son was a weakness he couldn't afford. Tain was the head of the Obsidian Order for 20 years, and the only head of the Obsidian Order to live long enough to retire. As the head of the Order, Tain trusted no one, with the exception of his housekeeper, Mila. He was known for his ruthlessness, and many said that he lacked a heart. Tain was also Garrick's immediate superior, whom he trained and molded into a mirror image of himself. Nevertheless, Tain was directly responsible for exiling Garrick after being betrayed by him in some way. Tain attempted to stage a comeback by destroying the Founders' homeworld with a combined fleet of Obsidian Order and Tal Shear ships. His plan was compromised by a changeling infiltrator, and the fleet was destroyed by the Gemahadar. Tain was assumed to have perished when his ship exploded, but he was actually captured by the Dominion and detained at Interment Camp 371. In 2373, Tain modified the Camp Barracks life support system to send a subspace signal to Garrick, indicating he was alive. By the time Garrick reached him, he was dying of heart trouble. On his deathbed, after being sure all his enemies were dead, Tain asked Garrick to escape and seek vengeance on the Dominion for what it had done to him. Garrick agreed, but only if Tain asked him as his father. Tain died after acknowledging that Garrick was his son. Topic. Tora Zial Tora Zial is the half Cardassian, half Bajoran daughter of Gul Dukat and Tora Napram. She spent most of her early life with her mother, and thus her name is structured as are all Bajoran names with the family name first. Her given name, Zial, is a popular Cardassian name. She was played by Cyia Batten in Indiscretion and Return to Grace by Tracy Middendorf in the episode For the Cause and by Melanie Smith, over six episodes from season 5's In Purgatory's Shadow, to season 6's Sacrifice of Angels. Zial was first introduced in the season 4 episode, Indiscretion. In this episode, Gul Dukat accompanied Kira Neris to the crash site of the Cardassian prison transport Ravenic. On the crash site, in the Dozaria system, Kira found out Dukat went along because his mistress, Tora Napram, was aboard the Ravenic. They discovered the grave of Tora Napram, and Dukat confessed Tora Napram and he had a daughter, Tora Zial, who was also on the transport. Dukat originally intended on killing Zial to protect his career, as it was an abomination for a Cardassian and a Bajoran to have a child, but Kira's arguments and his own paternal love convinced him not to kill his daughter. They found Zial in a Breen prison camp on the planet and freed her. Even though her mixed heritage made living on either Cardassia or Baja unrealistic due to the inherent prejudices, she ended up spending time on Baja attending a university there. After living there for a short time, Zial moved to DS9 where she felt more comfortable and at ease among the station's diverse population, with the bonus of being closer to Major Kira whom she considered a big sister. She was also friends with Elam Garrick and Julian Bashir. She briefly evacuated to Baja after the Cardassian, Dominion troops reclaimed DS-9 from the Federation but eventually returned to be near her father Gul Dukat and her close friend Kira Neris. 
After she came to realize what type of man her father really was, she agreed to help Quark liberate Rom, Kira, Jake and Leda from prison. They had been imprisoned for attempting to sabotage the Cardassian, Dominion forces planned disarmament of the Federation minefield around the wormhole, which was preventing the Gamma Quadrant's Dominion reinforcements from entering the Alpha Quadrant season 6 episode, Sacrifice of Angels. While her father was attempting to convince her to flee the station and return to Cardassia with him before the Federation troops retook the station, she was killed by Gul Dukat's first officer Dama after he overheard her confession to her father about having helped free the new Resistance members. Dukat underwent an immediate and near catatonic mental breakdown after witnessing his daughter's death right before his eyes. Wayan <laughs> 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 Dominion Vorder character played by Jeffrey Combs, debuting in To the Death, broadcast May 13, 1996. Topic: Kai Winner Darmai held the title of Vedek during the Cardassian occupation of Baja, and claimed to have been beaten for her religious teachings. She had a contemptuous attitude toward Bajorans who fought in the underground resistance cells, because she felt she did not get proper credit for helping to fight for Baja's liberation. She was played by Louise Fletcher. Wynne makes her first appearance objecting to the teachings of Keiko O'Brien in the Deep Space Nine school, in the episode, In the Hands of the Prophets. In particular, she objects to Keiko's teaching of only the scientific information about the Bajoran wormhole, instead of teaching the religious mythos regarding it. Wynne views the science-based teachings as blasphemy, and eventually her influence results in all of the Bajoran students being pulled from the school. Later, a bomb is detonated inside the school. Commander Benjamin Sisko meets with Vedek Barail on Baja and asks him to reprimand Wynne before she stirs up more violence, but he declines to enter into the conflict. Wynne also directs one of her supporters to assassinate Barail, who is Wynne's chief rival in the Vedek assembly. The failed assassination attempt is made during a speech Burrell is giving calling for an end to conflicts over the school. Wynne's involvement, although suspected by Major Kira Neris, is never proven. Ever the ambitious opportunist, Wynne later aligned herself with an extremist group called The Circle. The Circle's goal was to eliminate all external influences from Baja, including the Federation, which would have served Wynne's purposes in getting rid of Commander Sisko, whom she resented as the emissary of the Prophets. The reward for her support would have been the guarantee of becoming Kai. Eventually it was discovered that the Circle was actually being supplied by the Kardashians. Major Kira managed to sneak into the council chambers and presented the evidence to the Council of Ministers. When Kira announced she has the thumb scan of a Cardassian ghoul signing off on a shipment of weapons to the Kresari, who in turn sent them on to the Circle, Wynne immediately changed sides telling Minister Jaro that if he truly believes the Kardashians were not supplying the weapons, he should not mind an examination of the evidence. In the episode, The Collaborator, the election for the next Kai approaches. Wynne seeks out and obtains information about the Kendra Valley Massacre, which she uses to manipulate Major Kira into investigating Vedek Barail Antos, who is in a relationship with Kira at the time. Ultimately, Barail is forced to withdraw, resulting in Wynne's election as Kai. Although Barail is later proven innocent by Kira, he chooses not to reveal the truth, which is that Kai Opaka had actually been responsible for the massacre, a move that resulted in 43 deaths, including that of her own son, but which had saved thousands of other Bajoran lives. Over the years, Barail faithfully kept the secret to protect the Bajoran people and preserve their religion. When the first minister of the provisional government dies, Wynne gets herself appointed to the political office, and tries to reclaim soil reclamation equipment developed by the Bajoran Agricultural Ministry and loaned to a group of farmers. She wants to have it used to reclaim soil for cash crops for sale off-planet, while a group of farmers led by Shakar, a former resistance leader, are trying to reclaim soil to produce food for Baja. Shakar and his people had been promised the reclamators, but Wynne, now leading the government, reneges on the previous leadership's promise. A brief insurrection, with Shakar's people preparing to fight security forces sent out by Wynne, results in the security force leader and Shakar burying the hatchet. Shakar challenges Wynne for the position of first minister in the upcoming election. Throughout her service as both Vedek and Kai, Wynne always proved to be selfish, arrogant, and power-hungry. She would do anything, and betray anyone to advance her own career and agenda. She is also jealous of other people receiving visions from the prophets, especially the alien, Sisko the Emissary. In the final days of the Dominion War, Wynne finally received what she believed to be a vision from the prophets, who tell her that a guide will soon appear to her. In reality, this vision was from the Pa Wraiths, and the guide 
was Gul Dukat, who had been surgically altered to look like a Bajoran. Dukat and Wynne soon became lovers, and he convinced her that to restore Baja, she must release the Pa Wraiths, who he claimed were the true prophets of Baja. To do this, Wynne obtained the Kost Amogen, a forbidden text, but found that the pages were blank. Her servant Solbor discovered what she and Dukat were planning. He revealed Dukat's true identity and threatened to expose them. As Wynne killed him to prevent this revelation, a drop of blood fell from the knife Wynne stabbed him with, and onto the blank pages of the Kost Amogen, revealing the text. Later when Dukat attempted to read the Kost Amogen himself, he was blinded, the text could only be read by the Kai, and cast out onto the streets by Wynne. After studying the text, Wynne discovered there is only one way to release the Pa Wraiths from the fire caves and hesitantly allowed Dukat to rejoin her. Back on Deep Space Nine in Vic Fontaine's Holosuit program, the prophets send Sisko a premonition about a dangerous situation on Baja. In the series finale, What You Leave Behind, and after the Battle of Cardassia, Sisko travelled to the fire caves on Baja to confront Wynne and Dukat. While Dukat and Sisko fight, Wynne realized she has made the wrong choices and that she had been blinded by her own ambitions. In an effort to correct all that she had done and redeem herself, she attempted to throw the Book of the Pa Wraiths into the fire and destroy it. Before she could do so, Dukat disintegrated her using powers given to him by the Pa Wraiths. <laughs> Yates, Cassidy Cassidy Danielle Yates, played by Penny Johnson Gerald, is a civilian freighter captain. She is introduced to Benjamin Sisko by his son Jake, who feels it is time for Sisko to start dating again after the death of his first wife Jennifer at Wolf 359. Jake's attempt at matchmaking is successful, and Cassidy and Sisko become lovers, even after her arrest and eventual imprisonment for aiding the Marquis. For the cause. Following her release from prison, the two resume their relationship. Rapture. Eventually, Cassidy becomes Sisko's second wife and, at the end of the series, she becomes pregnant with their child. When Sisko leaves to join the Prophets, he tells her that he will be away for a while, but would eventually return to her. <laughs> Zek Zek was the Grand Nagus of the Ferengi Alliance throughout most of the 24th century. He is played by Wallace Shawn. Zek attempted retirement shortly after the discovery of the wormhole near Baja. He arrived on DS9 and during a business meeting announced Quark would be his successor, and then appeared to have died. Eventually it was discovered that Zek faked his death by entering into a trance his attendant Maihadi taught him. The whole setup was a test to see if his son Crax was ready to take over, but Crax failed miserably, by trying to seize power, assisted by Rom, by attempting to kill Quark instead of acquiring it quietly. The proper approach was to learn all the favorable deals and assume power by subterfuge and cunning, in keeping with Rule of Acquisition number 168, Whisper Your Way to Success. Zek visited the Bajoran prophets within the wormhole in an attempt to gather information about the future which he could use to increase his profits. Instead, the prophets devolved Zek's personality to that of a proto-Ferengi, before his people had dedicated their lives to the acquisition of wealth. During his time in this state, Zek made many radical reforms to his people's laws and government directing his people away from their greedy ways, including reformatting the long-standing Ferengi rules of acquisition. He was eventually changed back and his reforms nullified after Quark appealed to the Prophet's fear of interaction with other corporeal life forms that might come to their domains to investigate the change. DS9. Prophet Motive. During a Tongo tournament on Ferengina, Zek received a tip from Ishka, the mother of Quark and Rom, which helped him make a comeback to win the tournament. They eventually fell in love and were briefly broken up by Quark at the prodding of Liquidator Brunt, who was plotting to succeed Zek as Nagus. The effort failed, Quark became aware of the plan, stopped Brunt's takeover and got Zek and Ishka together again. DS9. Ferengi Love Songs Zek, suffering from failing memory, bequeathed all his financial dealings to the financially brilliant Ishka, eventually caving into her not-so-subtle prods for female rights. He was once again deposed, this time by Brunt, after he amended the Ferengi constitution to allow females to wear clothes in public. He was reinstated after the populace learned of the new and exciting business opportunities such reforms would pave. Under Ishka's influence, he further reformed the Ferengi political and economic system into a significantly less capitalist model. Eventually, he and Ishka retired to Risa after naming Rom as his successor. See also List of Star Trek characters <laughs>